Sue Nelson and thanks for joining me on the Create the Future podcast brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. London's skyline has continually changed over the centuries and my guest is a structural engineer who has worked on one of the capital's most recent and distinctive additions, the Shard. Roma Agrawal is a former Young Structural Engineer of the Year, made the Telegraph's top 50 women engineers in the UK list and is probably one of the few engineers who's been photographed by Annie Leibowitz. An Associate Director and Framework Manager at ACOM, Roma is also the author of the award-winning book Built, The Hidden Stories Behind Our Structures. OK, let's start with the Shard, that wonderfully elongated pyramid structure that's currently the tallest building in Western Europe. Which parts did you work on? I actually spent about six years of my career working on the design of the Shard um, as part of a larger team of structural engineers and other engineers. And I spent the first couple of years actually working on what we describe as the enabling works. Before you can even build a structure, especially in a city like central London, you have to think about what all the other structures are that are around that site. So we had Victorian brick arches, we had some tube tunnels running adjacent to the site, and we had like a 1960s block, we had a bus station, there was all sorts of stuff. And we had to kind of cut and carve all these historical structures before we could actually even build the new tower. So that that's a bit like forensic engineering, I guess, in some ways, because I was looking at these drawings from even from the 1800s, trying to understand how these historical structures worked before we you know, made any changes to them. So that was super interesting, but not something that really gets talked about. Was it like being a, an archaeologist as well, in a way? So literally, archaeologists got involved as well at some point. Usually in London, they want to have a look at the records and what the likelihood of you know, Roman ruins or something being there. It is a little bit because you're looking at um, little microfiches. So they're like little bits of film that are about an inch wide where, you know, um, librarians and archivists have recorded these old drawings from over 100 years ago. And you kind of look at them and try and understand how these structures would have been built. And you also have to do tests on the materials to make a judgment of how strong those materials are. So I think that's a really interesting part of particularly the engineering of something like the Shard, where there's a lot of background work that happens before the kind of the shiny steel tower even goes up. Um, But then I was involved in the shiny steel tower as well. So I helped with the design of the foundations and I helped with the design of the very top, the, you know, the tip of the tower, which is where the viewing gallery is that we call the spire. That's quite lucky in a way, isn't it? Because you were involved in a way that often with engineers is, is the hidden part, the bits that people don't see and take for granted, the foundations. But actually, you not only got that, but you got the sort of um, the bling at the top, the thing that's most (laughs) recognisable as well. Yeah, I mean, because I had been on that project for so long, I started off as one of the most junior engineers on the project. And I'd always, always throughout that whole process wanted to be involved in the design of the Spire. So I used to just keep nudging my boss and reminding my boss every few months, like, yeah, you know, when when we start the Spire, I'd really like to be involved. Um, And I think that's one of the lessons I learned, uh, you know, when when you start working, is that if there is something that you want to do in your career is a particular material you want to be involved in designing or a particular part of a tower or whatever that might be. Um, it's really important to kind of advocate for yourself and ask for what you want. And, and you never know, you might get it. Absolutely. In fact, my um, grandmother always used to say, or my nana, if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah, that's very good advice. You can't just sit there thinking, I'd really like to do this please choose me, because if you don't say it, people don't know. That's really good advice. How did you actually do the work, particularly on the spire? Did you have to go up however many stories it is and be at that peak? So for somebody that's scared of heights, um, that will very quickly cure you, make you or break you, I guess. We do so, so much work before anything is actually even made. Um, I spent months looking at the forces. So we worked with a wind tunnel engineers so that we could study what the f- effects of the different wind forces were on this tower. That's right, because some 
some buildings do sway. All buildings sway. Oh, all of them. I didn't realize <laughs> so that. So all, all buildings sway because there is going to be natural movement. And the trick for us as engineers is to make sure that that movement isn't too much and that it isn't perceivable. Those are the two things that we're really aiming for. So we do wind tunnel testing, especially for towers of the height of the shard, um, to understand what the forces are and how they interact with the materials that we put in. So that was a big part that we worked on. And then the other thing is, you know, yes, we would love for our towers just to appear in place and just be there. But of course, it's a staged construction sequence. So we have to think about the logistics, you know, how are we going to actually bring pieces of steel to the site in the middle of central London? How are we going to get it up to that height, you know, 300 meters up in the air? That's the highest anyone's ever built in the UK. How are we going to do that safely? And then how are we going to actually connect all these different bits of steel together to make sure that it can be done quickly um, and safely as possible? So in that, the structural engineers and me, we worked with the steel manufacturers, you know, the people that were actually pouring the steel sections together. Um, and we also worked with the contractors that were coming up with the crane logistics, you know, how heavy were the pieces of steel that needed to be lifted by the crane? Where could the crane sit? So, you know, it is absolutely fascinating to get involved in, in something like that. And it sounds as if you worked with a huge array of different people who were experts in their particular field. Yes, and I think that's one thing about engineering that I didn't fully appreciate when I was studying it at university was exactly how collaborative it had to be, and especially between different disciplines, as you mentioned. So at university, at least, you know, kind of 15 years ago when I was doing the course, and things have changed, I was just doing projects with other structural engineers. But nowadays, a lot of universities are doing group projects that are cross-discipline. So you have structural engineers, mechanical engineers, public health engineers, um, architects even, coming together to do these projects. Because what you quickly realize is that you can have all the technical skills in the world, but if you can't explain those complex principles to somebody who's not a structural engineer in a way that's accessible and understandable to them, then it, it, you know, it makes for a much harder project. You mentioned um, building materials. How have building materials changed over, over the centuries? In some ways, they haven't changed at all. Um, and I always find it really interesting that you know, the brick, which in its most rudimentary um, form is a 10,000 year old technology, is something that we still use today. And steel has been around for a long time. I would say steel manufacture to the mass manufacture to the extent that we use it today really happened during the Industrial Revolution. So more than 100 years ago. And concrete, of course, has been around for thousands of years. The Romans had an, an amazing recipe that they used more than 2,000 years ago. So in those senses, the base materials that we use haven't actually changed. I think what's changed is the process and the industrialization and the scale at which we can manufacture these things and perhaps to some extent our understanding of how these materials work. I mentioned in the introduction that, you know, that describing the building for those who've, who've not seen it, this elongated sort of stretch, tall pyramid. Did it feel like you were making the modern day equivalent of the pyramids at the time? <laughs> they are so, so incredibly different. So absolutely, I agree with you that the shape could be described as an elongated pyramid, but the way that they work are actually completely different. So there are two main forms of frames, I guess, that you can give a building. So that's how a building takes gravity and how it distributes the forces of gravity through its own body and down into the foundations. What the pyramids did was basically to stack up a huge amount of material so that the weight of the material just goes straight down. Whereas the shard was more like a frame or a skeleton. So if you think about our human body, like when we stand up, our weight is being channeled through all our different bones and it's getting split at our hips and then it's going down our two legs. And the way the shard works with its steel and concrete columns is much more similar to this kind of skeletal system compared to this pure gravity system that the pyramids used. That's really interesting. How would you define a successful building? For me, from the point of view of a structural engineer, a successful building is one that has the minimal amount of material that's required. 
So it's very easy to shove a lot of material into a building to make it safe. And then we know that it will work and that it will stand up, it'll be stable, it'll be safe. But the sophistication and the skill of the structural engineer is in minimizing the amount of material, which reduces the weight, which gives a lot more flexibility in the spaces that we're creating so that we don't have these big chunky bits of structure interfering with big open plan offices, for example. And of course, it makes it a lot more eco-friendly and sustainable to, to reduce the amount of material we're using. So that's my first definition of a successful building. And then, of course, what happens later on is that human beings start interacting with the structures you've created. And then for me, you know, when I see people, for example, taking photographs in front of the shard or standing on the footbridge that I worked on early in my career and just seeing people enjoying the structure and, and being happy in it and, and being productive in it um, is, is, of course, a huge mark of success. That's right, because there's, there's a lot of emotion attached to people's either love or dislike of certain structures. It's funny the way they can really divide people. They can. And I think we forget, you know, what percentage of our day we spend interacting with structures because we're, we're at home or we're at work, we're in a school, we, you know, we could be anywhere. And for a large proportion of our day, we are inside a structure, you know, especially now in today's kind of situation where a lot of us are spending a lot of time at home, we're suddenly noticing our home in different ways, I think. So I was talking to somebody the other day that, oh, we're clearing out our cupboards, we're, you know, looking at our bookshelves and thinking about what we actually want on there. But I think it, it kind of defines that relationship a bit more strongly when you when you realize that, oh, I'm going to be in this area or this space for a really long time. What are things about it that I haven't noticed before? And I think that's a really huge motivation for me in, in my other work, which is trying to promote engineering and to just make people a bit more conscious and excited by the structures around them. Well, one of the things that you did in order to you know promote engineering was write your book, Built, which was hugely successful. And you also went into sort of engineering failures there as well. And I thought that was really interesting, particularly in terms of what led to the collapse of the World Trade Center, the, 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 the mm. two towers. For people who've not yet read your book, how would you sum up what those building failures were? I think building failures occur for a few different types of reasons. And unfortunately, a lot of that is human error because at the end of the day, you know, people make mistakes and sometimes we're pushing boundaries. We're trying things that we haven't tried before and sometimes they don't work. Sometimes those failures can be, you know, not life threatening. So, for example, the Wobbly Bridge, the Millennium Bridge in London, which was swaying a lot when it first opened. Or it can be quite catastrophic and, and really tragic in the sense of the World Trade Centers. Sometimes things change. So the World Trade Centers were built more than 50 years ago, about 70 years ago, perhaps. And it had actually been designed for a plane impact. But the size of the planes that they actually designed that impact for um, was smaller than the size of the plane that actually hit it in the end in, in 2001. So they were of their time, effectively. Exactly. So, you know, we also um, need to think about the longevity of our buildings. So if our buildings are going to be there for 70 years, 100 years, then trying to anticipate the changes that can happen. And then one more area that failures sometimes happen in is during construction. So where I was talking about before that construction is a staged process, the building could be absolutely safe in its final configuration, but while you're building it, the way the forces are interacting with your structure are different. So it is down to the engineers and the contractors who are building it to deeply think about what those stages are, what the forces are, and how that might affect that same beam or column in a very different way in that temporary stage compared to the final stage and making sure it's strong enough. Now, you did a degree in physics and a master's in engineering. What produced that change change of gear? Because obviously there's a big overlap with the maths. There is. So I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and career when I was 16, 17 years old applying for university. I loved maths and physics, so decided to pursue that at university. And quite rightly, 
felt that with a physics degree, I could do quite a big range of different careers once I graduated. I was then working a summer job to earn some money for about three months. And I had a particular quite boring project that I had to do, which was to go and record where all the um, fire safety equipment, important but boring job, was in the physics department at Oxford. And so I was doing this job, but luckily I was surrounded by engineers. And every so often they would sort of throw me a little tidbit and say, oh, you know, I need to design this holder for a lens, which is going to get cooled down to minus 70 degrees. Or here's this little piece of equipment that we need to design a vibration stand for so that we can transport it easily. And I suddenly just thought, this is so incredibly interesting. These people are using maths and physics to solve everyday real problems. So that was, I guess, the light bulb moment for me where I, I could I saw that I could use my physics and math skills to, you know, make stuff. Yeah. And were you one of those kids that, like a lot of engineers, completely into Lego building stuff? <laughs> yes. I loved Lego. We also had this amazing crane set, which, you know, so we used to build cranes nearly every weekend or or towers or... I think the, the kind of that curiosity and making stuff is innate in so many children, if not, you know, all children. Um, and I was lucky to kind of rediscover that later on. I have noticed that a bit like in the medical profession, quite a lot of engineers have got engineers in the family. Do, do you have engineers in the family? My dad is an engineer. He's an electrical engineer. And the thing is that he stopped working as an electrical engineer when I was very young and had to take over our family business in India due to kind of family situation. So in some senses, I wasn't exposed to what an everyday career in engineering would look like. And my mum did maths and science at university and was a computer programmer. So I think what happened with my parents is that, that you know, that STEM background kind of filtered through to me and my sister and resulted in them encouraging us to play with blocks at the weekend and so on. So while I wasn't necessarily exposed to what the day-to-day -day life, working life of an engineer might be like, I think that impact of the way you think um, and so on did really filter through. Now you mentioned India there and you've had quite an interesting background in terms of where you've lived. London, where you are now, New York and Mumbai. How did that sort of spread of uh, locations sort of affect your attitude or maybe your approach to, to your work? That's a really interesting question. So I was in the US when I was really quite young but I do have these quite vivid memories of wandering around the streets of New York, which, you know, I used to live in a really small town in northern New York State. So it was a huge contrast. And then going to Bombay was a huge contrast again. So we went from living in this kind of large wooden house in the countryside to living in a seven story concrete tower. Then I moved to London and I lived in a house with, with an aunt and uncle for a few years went to university and then that was all different again. So I, I think in some ways I've just lived in very, very contrasting places. I think probably one of the biggest influences would have been living in Bombay because I think over there it was very obvious what the, the benefits of engineering were. So it's a developing city, there were new roads being constructed all the time and then you could see that traffic would ease in a particular area and then they would build a bridge and then that would help again. And we used to experience power cuts and cuts to our water. So I think we understood that, you know, these fundamental pieces of infrastructure are so important and what the effect is when they don't work very well. So I think engineering is a lot more in people's consciousness. It's given the respect it deserves effectively that people really yeah. do rate engineers very highly. I completely agree. And, and I think... I always had this vague understanding that engineering as a profession exists. I didn't understand the day-to-day, -day, you know, workings of it, but I understood that it made a difference to people and to society and so on. So I did find it quite strange when I came to the UK and people just had no idea what it is that engineers do. And it used to be there, right? Like we had these golden age of engineering in the industrial era, but in some way that's I guess faded into the background in the UK so, so I think having that really international background has meant that engineering and the effect it has on society 
it is quite that you know it's very present in in my thinking is the attitude towards women engineers as high in india as it is for the engineering profession as as a whole yes it in some ways it's a complicated question to answer so there are a lot of young women that aspire to be engineers so that's brilliant i think there are some other different societal challenges that women face in india that could prevent them from going into the workforce um but again things are sort of progressing and changing but i do feel that you know a lot of young women aspire to be engineers and that's often software related computing related but it's definitely something that young women think about so in some ways i found the gender divide different there is a still a gender divide in india but it's different in the uk where i was sort of surprised to see that young girls are often just told that this is not for them or they think that it's not for them that's a very different um issue than i saw in india do you think the uk could learn from india in this respect in terms of their um psycom effectively it should be engcom shouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> i would say asia in general so looking to south korea to taiwan even to malaysia um singapore you know countries like that seem to do really well with female representation in engineering compared to the west but even if we look closer to home eastern europe has a lot more women engineers than the uk does the uk is actually the lowest in the whole of europe it's astonishing really isn't it every time i hear that i can't quite believe it and i do think it really comes down to how respected engineering is as a profession in society so if it's given more kudos more respect more pro a higher profile then everyone will see it as something worth going for exactly. effectively exactly exactly and i think um another thing that's a bit different between you know the us the uk uh, compared to the eastern countries that i've mentioned is the emphasis on mathematical education and scientific education where we're sort of told that oh if you want to get a high paying secure good job then study science study maths you know these are the subjects you should be studying and that's often to the detriment of english and history and in the west it seems or you know the uk and the us it seems to be quite different where people aspire more to be lawyers or to study english and so again there's this kind of cultural divide in in what what the aspirations are so you know i i think students in the uk should be studying maths and you know at least one science for longer than we currently are you do an awful lot of psycom you you were awarded the rook award for promotion of engineering public promotion of engineering by the royal academy of engineering you've talked to schools you've done ted talks and i even saw that a school in birmingham named a building after you. I mean that's that's a, what an honor. I know that one really did make me cry. Um because they they got the students to actually vote for which role model they wanted to name their building after. So the headmistress selected a few different people and then they had to go away and do research about all of us. Um and they picked me and that was just so lovely. It is lovely, isn't it? It is so lovely. And I think what was particularly touching for me was that that school it's an academy it's got a lot of low income students there in the middle of birmingham and the vast majority of the students there are from bame backgrounds as well so you know it, it felt particularly lovely to me that um you know i could just be a, a face of something that they may not have thought about that was possible for them and um you were also to be a face of a face of a marks and spencers campaign <laughs> <laughs> That's going back about 5 years now but that had quite an impact. It was one of those really odd um experiences in my life I never thought I would have where I got this email about it and I just thought it was a hoax, you know, I I didn't really take it very seriously but it did happen and the reason I decided to do it was because it was a campaign called the Leading Ladies Campaign so they had women from lots of different fields involved and they were varying levels of famousness i guess there was me um who was this kind of structural engineer and then there was emma thompson you know so there was a huge range of how well known we were i saw a picture of you standing there looking 
glorious in a in a dress um and there in the foreground was sort of Rita Ora yes exactly but I think the reason I was keen to do that was because you know again I felt that if people saw my name and saw me and then saw my profession which they said they would also talk about so they said structural engineer it might just make people think twice and say oh I didn't realize young women young Indian women wearing these glamorous dresses could be structural engineers so you know hopefully I just made a few people think a bit deep more deeply about what structural engineers actually look like. Now, I I mentioned at the start that you are something called a framework manager for ACOM. Uh, I must confess, I have no idea what a framework manager is. Uh, I know you're on sabbatical at the moment, but before we discuss that, what is a framework manager? Of course. I worked as quite, you know, a poor structural engineer for most of my career. But for the last two years or so, I've been branching out a little bit. And I think it's important to talk about the fact that you know as an engineer you can kind of go off into all different directions so what I now look at is the front end of the project so before I would get a project on my desk and then I would start to make that project a reality but before that even happens a lot needs to be done so I now work with clients you know with people that want to build housing that want to commission work to improve air quality in their local borough for example in London. And so what I'm doing is I understand and work with my whole company to think about all the different types of engineering services that we offer. I then look at clients who are generally um, local councils in London or local government in London to see what their targets are. So all, all local councils you know, want to improve air quality, they want to build housing, they've got all these different things they're thinking about. And I try and match those two things together and then actually start working on the contracts and think about how we're going to deliver these things. So once all of that's done and the contracts are signed, I now pass that project on to an engineer, which, you know, used to be me once upon a time, but now, you know, a a team of engineers kind of takes it away. So I find that front end of projects really quite fascinating which is actually, you know, what project is needed in the first place and how can we make that happen? That's something that quite a few engineers go into, isn't it, is project manager. And it's usually as a result of having to deal with very big projects that help you understand what exactly what's involved, how many areas are involved. Because after you worked on the, on the Shard, you also worked um, on Crystal Palace Station. And, and I'm assuming, because that has underground areas as well is that you've got to take loads of the surrounding infrastructure into account yeah I mean I think that's true for pretty much any type of project that you do in London and I think most of my projects apart from one have been in London so it is it is really fascinating when you have to manage all these different interfaces so I worked on an apartment block which had interfaces with network rail trains and with the Dockland Light Railway trains, which are two separate companies, if if you're not familiar with London. And then it also had interfaces with private land and public land. And, we, you know, we're trying to build apartments. So, you know, designing the steel and concrete in some ways is the easy part. But I had to work with all these different rail authorities and water authorities to ensure that they were happy that our project was safe for them. So that's how you slowly kind of transition to this project management type of roles that you're talking about and you also find out what your skills are and I you know I I love talking to people as as we've discovered so when an engineer can effectively engage with clients and and explain things to clients and to train operators and water operators about how the engineering is going to work then that becomes a very valuable skill and that's one that I've been trying to pursue for the last couple of years in my career. So what are you doing at the moment? You have a, a sabbatical. Are you? I know you've got a, a young child. Are you writing another book as well? <laughs> My maternity leave officially finished just a few days ago. And then I did request that I get a sabbatical. So I'm taking a year off. And I sadly can't quite tell you what I'm doing um, at the moment, but I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination. <laughs> In general, the projects are around communication again, And I did work on a podcast as well. So there's three episodes of a little mini series I did called Building Stories, which which is free to download. So I'd, you know, 
love for listeners to have a listen to that as well. Well, good luck with uh, the rest of your career. It's um, I'm, I'm sure actually listening to you will make a lot of people interested in structural engineering. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's it for Create the Future. Thanks to my guest, structural engineer Roma Agrawal. Do join me next month for another insight into the world of engineering in our Create the Future podcast. Bye.